Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today, this week, we're starting a brand new series entitled The Price of Doing and the Cost of Ignoring. This message today is entitled, part one, is entitled Rewards and Consequences. You can ask any Christian and they will quickly tell you that all you have to do to be saved is to believe in Jesus, which is the truth, but it is not the whole truth. There's something more. You can't just believe that Jesus existed or, or that there's a God up above. The scripture says that even demons believe that there's a God and shudder. So there's something more than just believing that there's a God. There's something more than just believing that Jesus exists or believing that Jesus saves. I want us to take a look at a parable that Jesus told just before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The last week of his life, this last week of his earthly ministry, less than a week later, Jesus would be dead, crucified, and poured out for the sins of the world. This would be one of his last opportunities to that, that, that he was having this earthly ministry to tell on a parable. This would be one of his last opportunities to reach disciples that were not fully committed. This would be one of his last opportunities to reach unbelievers. So Jesus speaks directly to the church. He speaks directly to his people. He speaks directly to his disciples, those who believed in him, those who followed him. He's talking to these people. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 19, verse 11 through 27. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your minus has made ten minus more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your minas has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming uh, that I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to the one who has the ten miners. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even that which he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Jesus had just left Zacchaeus' house, where Zacchaeus, a notorious chief tax collector had just gotten saved. And not just saved, but radically saved. When the people who were there saw that, uh, what Jesus, that Jesus was going to be a guest in this notorious tax collector's house, they began to grumble against it. He began, they began to grumble against Jesus. They began to grumble that, that Jesus would go and be a guest 
of this sinner. So Jesus began to tell this parable that we just read. Verse 11 says, Luke chapter 19, verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. This word or this verse might just seem to be thrown in there just to make up words or to increase the word count. But that is not the case at all, as it is never the case in Scripture. In Scripture, every word means something. Every word is significant. And, and so it is in this case as well. So let us break it down. It says, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable. The word they though are those who grumbled. In other words, when those who started grumbling heard Zacchaeus' confession of faith, not that he just believed, not that he just believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but what he was going to do with his new found faith. They also heard what Jesus said. And this is what Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 19, verse 9 and verse 10. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. There are two main topics there. Salvation has come, and the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. These two, two, two um, topics are lead up to one statement, one main point. And that point is salvation. It's all about saving the lost. Everything that we do is to be geared towards the harvest. The book of Hebrews, or the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. You know, when I first got saved as a, a young teenager in a church in Gretna, Louisiana, every Tuesday night, I believe it was Tuesday night, we would go out and what we call soul winning. And I can remember knocking on doors and being invited in our people's homes. And we would share the good news. We would share the gospel. And these people would accept Jesus. Not, not everyone, but a lot of those would accept Jesus. This was a highlight for me as a young teenager. And I always remember, I don't remember the messages, I don't remember what went on in our youth group, but I remember soul winning. And that I believe is what Jesus was trying to get across to, to the, the, those people who were beginning to grumble. It's about salvation. Look what just happened to Zacchaeus. He just got saved and not just saved, but radically saved. Research tells us that 73% of born-again Christians agree that they have a personal responsibility to share their faith with others. Yet the reality is that only 52% admit to sharing the gospel at least once in the past year with someone with different beliefs. Only one time per year. 49% of leadership ministries spend zero time in an average week ministering outside the church. I also read this one statistic, and I, I couldn't find it for, for this message, but in this statistic, it, it said that the younger the church is, like churches that are under three years of age, it takes like two to three people to win one soul. Anything over that, when the church, the older the church get, it takes up to 10 people to win one soul. Which means that the older the church is, the more comfortable the members are just to come in and just to warm a pew. Not, not sharing the good news, not sharing their beliefs, not sharing life with people. They're just comfortable with trying to skate into eternity. But Jesus said that those who try to just skate into eternity will not make it in. If you have a minor and you wrap it up in a handkerchief and hide it in the ground until it is turned and say, Lord, here is your minor. Jesus will say, you are a wicked servant. And he will take your minor from you and he will give it to someone who is preaching the good news. Someone who is saying, 
Jesus loves you. Do you know who Jesus is? Listen to my testimony. Lord, this is what I intend to do. Jesus expects us to be about the harvest, to be about the Father's business. Look with me, please, at Luke chapter 19, verse 11, the second part that we just read. Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. They were near to Jerusalem. Jesus was heading to his death to be sacrificed as a sacrificial lamb for the lost. This would be like his death um, bed speech. Less than a week later, as I said, Jesus would be dead, hung on a cross. The scripture goes on to say, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. They believed that the kingdom of God was to appear then and there. Therefore, there was no more time for evangelizing. There was no more time for soul winning. But Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They're white onto harvest. Go out there, pray for workers, pray for harvesters. Pray that people will go out there and harvest this. They, there are in need of workers in the field and people, his people, Jesus' people, those who identify as Christians, those, they just go to church and they just satisfy to warm a bench and never share the good news. Jesus said this ought not be. So they, they believed that the kingdom of God were to appear immediately. Therefore, there was no more time for evangelizing. But Jesus said, today is the day of repentance. This is the time now, right now. This is the time to win souls. Moving on to verse 12. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. This nobleman represents Jesus himself. After Jesus' death, burial, and his resurrection on the third day, Jesus was on the earth for a period of 40 days. And he appeared to many. After that, he was taken up into heaven and there he is to this day. He was taken up to heaven. He sat down on the right hand of God the Father. And he's making intercession for us. He, he, he's looking. He's pulling for us. And he said that anything that we ask him in his name, he'll do it for us. But Jesus is coming back. He's coming back because when the kingdom is given on to him, fully given on to him, he will come back. Let us, let us not get ahead of ourselves. So Jesus will come back real soon for those who are faithful, those who are waiting for his return. I want us to look at verse 13. Calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. Now, according to Derek Prince, the number 10 represents a congregation. During the diaspora, when, when the Jews were scattered throughout the nations, they were only allowed to establish a synagogue if they had the, the minimum of 10 men. If they had nine, they couldn't establish a synagogue. They had to wait until they got 10. The other witness was, is the scripture that, that we just read about the 10 minors. Now, a minor is a piece of coin, it's, it's money. So, in case of those who do not know, a minor is money. Now, the other one that, that talks about 10 is the 10 virgins in, in Matthew chapter 25. These all refer to the body of Christ. It's talking about the church. So, this nobleman, which represents Jesus, called 10 of his servants, the church, and gave them a minor each. In other words, he gave them gifts. Some have one, some have uh, more than one, but we all have at least one gift. Then he went away 
into a far country. Today, Jesus is in heaven. He sat down on his throne next to the heavenly father, our father, his father. And, and, and so, but he's coming back. So this nobleman went into a faraway country. And, and he expects us, while he's gone, he expects us, the church, to use the gifts that he has given us until, which is called the Great Commission. You can read about it in, in, um, in Mark chapter 16. It's called the Great Commission. We're to win souls. He said, go into all the world and tell the good news. Tell them about me. Tell them about life. Tell them about salvation that I've purchased for them on the cross with my own blood. Tell them that they may hear, that they may believe, that they may live, and that they may not die. So even if it's just one gift that you have, we're to use that gift. And we can get more gifts by the laying on of hands, but we first have to use the one gift that we have. And Paul says, stir up the gifts that are within you. So we're to multiply the mina, or we're to multiply the gifts that were given. We, we are to, while we're waiting for what the early church fathers, what, what the disciples called the blessed hope, the return of Jesus. We are to work in the harvest field until Jesus' return. I cannot stress that enough, how important it is to work in the harvest field. But more on that later in this series. Notice what Jesus said. The servants were instructed to engage in business until the nobleman returned. They were not to hold on to their minor. They were not to keep their gifts to themselves. They were not to sit around and lazily warm a pew until his return. They were not to, in, they were to engage in business. They were, were to invest their minor for the kingdom's sake. They were to be about the father's business until he returned. Verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Believe me when I tell you that the world has rejected Jesus and has rejected his salvation. They have rejected his free gift of life, his invitation to live forever. And, and these people did that. They rejected it and they said, I, we do not want this man to reign over us. And you know what? That's exactly what we're doing today. We do not want that man, Jesus, to reign over us. We try to hush up that name. Well, not the church, but, but the world. The world tries to hush up the name of Jesus. In a comedy stand-up routine, Sarah Silverman said, and I quote, I hope the Jews did kill Christ. I'll do it again. I'd Blank and do it again in a second. We say, Lord, forgive her, for she know not what she said. Another man, Stuart Serdlow, who claims to have time traveled, and I'm not saying that his statement is true, and I'm not saying that his statement is false. What I'm saying is that he said he was sent back by the world's governments, to assassinate Jesus. Whoever was doing this time travel, they sent him back to assassinate Jesus. And he saw Jesus, and Jesus was standing up, 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 on, on the stairs or something, and he had a gun, and he was about to shoot him when Jesus looked at him, and he couldn't do it, and he turned and ran away. What I'm saying is this. I'm not trying to validate what this man said. What I'm saying is that the world has rejected Jesus. The people have rejected Jesus. The world's governments have rejected Jesus. They're saying we do not want this man to reign over us. Even right here in America, our governments are trying to create um, laws that are un unfavorable to Christians. They're unfavorable to the scripture, to the Bible. It is totally acceptable to teach what can be considered pornography 
to elementary school age children. But Lord forbid if we were to share salvation, share the free gift of life with children. Lord forbid that we would try to give these children hope in a hopeless world. We cannot openly name the name of Jesus in our classrooms. And don't even dare to try to bring a Bible on the school grounds and say, there's a, there's a right way, there's a wrong way. You can change your way of life. You know, I had a coworker uh, who, who was into Wicca and I tried witnessing to my coworker, but my coworker was not interested in Jesus at all. Um, she, she believed that it would be better to worship the many gods than just one God. So she worshiped nature. And I took her out to lunch and we, we talked, and, but she was not convinced. Her heart was hardened. And she said that her husband was just like that. His heart was hardened against Jesus and against the gospel because things that uh, had happened in his life. And I suppose they, they blamed Jesus, but they, they were not at all interested in the things of God. We even have a friend who's into paganism and he's proud to be a pagan. He's proud to have his patron God as Zeus or Jupiter. And you know, I, I'm not condemning these people. I think, I believe that the church has dropped the ball. We, 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 we're no longer zealous about the things of God. We no longer have a desire, it seems, to see souls saved. We are satisfied with just skating into eternity. You know, if we're saved, then that's all I care about. We have to care about the harvest because Jesus loves the harvest, but his body do not care. People are so led astray that they've lost sight of the real truth. And Christians are afraid to tell their co-workers about Jesus because fear of offending someone. We're afraid of breaking some rule that we're not allowed to talk about religion at work. We're not allowed to speak about Jesus. We're not allowed to say there's a right way to live. We are not allowed to give hope. I'm telling you, the world has rejected Jesus. They're flocking to religions like Wicca, New Age, or they're, they're, they're claiming no religious affiliation at all. The nuns, they call them. Even during the pandemic, the churches were deemed non-essential by our government. Non-essential. And some pastors were happy with that, to shut up their doors and be deemed non-essential. But let us get back to the story. I want to share some statistics. According to Open Doors, these are the statistics for, for the past year or so. Over 340 million Christians live in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. 4,761 Christians killed for their faith. 4,488 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked. 4,277 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. That is almost 10,000 Christians either killed or imprisoned just for being Christian. And these are only the confirmed cases. These are only the cases that affect open doors or that they know about. There are countries that Christians and, and, and Christianity is, is frowned on. Christian converts are killed. Christians are killed. And they call it honor killings. But there's nothing honorable about cr killing Christians. Precious is the death of the saints in the Lord's eyes. 
So these statistics does not include the statistics in the free world right here in America or there in Europe or there in, in, in um, Canada. There is no other way of putting it. The world and its governments or the world as a whole has rejected the free gift of life offered by Jesus because they have rejected Jesus. So in closing, I just want to sum up really quickly what I've said. Everything that we should be, that everything that we do should be pointed back to the harvest. Everything that we do should be all about winning souls for Jesus. That is the point to take away. Souls, souls, souls. Because everyone will be judged on their faithfulness to the Great Commission. What did you do with Jesus and his salvation? Did you wrap it up in a handkerchief? Did you hide it in the ground? Did you not put it on deposit? Did you not try to multiply it? What did you do with the minor that were given to you? What did you do with your gift? The gift of salvation. What did you do with it? Did you share it? You will have to give an account for that. Jesus is not looking or he's not coming back. For bench warmers. That's not what he called us to do. He's not called us to fill a church. He's not called us just to be a member of a congregation. He's called us to work. He's called us to labor in the, in the vineyard. He's called us to labor in, in the wheat field. He's called us to work for souls. You're not expected just to come to church. Warm a pew. And go back home. There's a spiritual battle for, for your soul, for the souls of your loved ones, for the souls of your friends, for the souls of your neighbors, for the souls of your, your, your co-workers. And you have to be in that battle. You have to be uh, awake and praying, seeking, telling. You're expected to witness to those that they may hear that they may believe so that they can live and not die. If you're a Christian, I would encourage you today to start telling others, start multiplying your mina. Tell others about the goodness of Jesus, what he has done for you. Share this broad broadcast. Share other broadcasts like, like this one. Broadcasts that, that, that I'm speak to you. Share it with others. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family. Share it with someone who, who might be in need of hearing that word. I want to encourage you. Let us win the world together for Jesus. Jesus is on his way back to get us. We don't have very, very much time to labor in the fields. We don't have very much time left to do business for our Lord. We don't have very much time left to win souls. Today is the day. Let us start today. Let us start speaking life. Let us start talking. Let us tell of the goodness of Jesus. So I want to ask you this question. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Oh, right, here's another question. Here's another way of putting it. When Jesus comes back, will he be coming back for you? And if he is, will he find you doing business for him? Will he find that you have multiplied your minor? You know, some people live their whole Christian life and never, ever win a soul. Why is that? Because they've never shared they're good news. They're, they're, they're okay talking about Jesus and the things of God with those like-minded. But what about those who are not serving? What about those who hate Jesus? Have you talked? Have you spoken with them? Are you comfortable telling them of the good news? 
So I want to encourage you, start doing that today. And if you don't know who Jesus is, let me invite you. Here's how. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Give me boldness. Give me confidence. Give me the words and the ability to share this faith. To share Jesus. To share life. Help me to multiply my mina. Multiply my gifts that Jesus has given me. Help me to live for you. And be faithful to the call. Be faithful to the Great Commission. Be faithful to working in the harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. As always, I want to encourage you to get the Bible, begin to read the Bible, highlight verses, commit those verses to memory. When you're witnessing, bring up those verses, share those verses. The, the, the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Divide and asunder soul and spirit, bone and marrow. Jesus, Jesus' word, it can save. It's not, listen to me, it's not your job to bring conviction on people. It's your job to share the good news. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction. Your job is to tell. Go and tell and leave it up to Jesus. I want you to please join us next week as we continue this series, The Price of Doing and the Cost of Ignoring. My name's Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.